I'm going to tell you a story. Love stories, right? We're a culture of stories. Stories are a powerful medium to spread ideas. Think about a story. You hear it, it becomes part of you. Stories have a way of creeping into your, sco- uh, your skin, getting into your soul, and they become a part of you. And soon you're retelling that story to somebody else. If you ever wondered why in India we don't have copyright laws, that's because we're an oral culture. We believe in telling stories, reabsorbing stories, telling them again. You know, that's a story culture. So I'm t- going to tell you a story. And there are some phrases that will start jumping out at you. One is, of course, this. The second is the Vivekin story. Okay. So those of you who know what Vivekin means, Vivekin is one who is intelligent, one who is wise. Many Indian languages it means that. And if you ever wondered what the secret is behind Vivek Oberoi's name, that's it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story that is about a search and a realization and a transformation. Just now we heard about how it takes a lifetime to shoot a photograph, to make a painting, right? Paleontologists have a term for that. It's called punctuated equilibrium. What punctuated equilibrium, what people discovered, paleontologists discovered, was that species never emerge like that. There's a long period of evolution before a new species emerges. That's the exact thing with ideas, with things that are happening. Ideas never come to you like that. Ideas are always gestating. They take a long while and suddenly they emerge. So that's punctuated uh, equilibrium, which is why I'm not calling it a discovery, I'm calling it a real. So I've talked about this mind, uh, the theme of this uh, you know, conference. I've organized it in terms of the imagination, in terms of the idea, then finally in terms of inspiration. Okay. So the imagine is a search and for me, the search begins in with a kind of transformation that happens in 1997, which is, I was a, till then a PhD student at the Wharton School, and suddenly I became a professor in a business school at Purdue University. Okay. Fantastic challenge, one of the big business schools in the country, and I was actually in the thick of what is now known as the dot com, trying to form some research questions here. So in this, when I looked at this, the the business world was very, very turbulent. Look at the IPOs here. So there were dot every day and they were becoming dot, dot, dots every other day. So there was all kinds of flux that was going on. Shares, the first day uh, returns of these companies were all over the place. So one of the key things that emerged for me is how can a company succeed or in the long term, how can it make a strategy when environment? In other words, how does a business become resilient? Okay, one of the key things that emerges, one quick answer that emerges is when you're in a turbulent environment, you need to develop an ability to adapt. Great great idea. But suddenly I see certain connections to our everyday lives. So what happens in our everyday life is you think you've you've studied really well for an exam and you go there and your mind goes blank. The next two hours dictate the course of your life for the rest of your life. You think a seven year thinking that he's going to be bathed by a male relative and something happens and life is changed forever. So life happens. Life happens all the time. What C. D. Lewis, the British poet said, the small, the scorching ordeals that fire one's irresolute clay. In fact, the story of uh, human resilience that we don't say quits. We get up, we dust ourselves, 
we look at the world with new eyes and we move on right we try to conquer the world again that is a big thing that emerged for me so what happened at this point was that i started to realize that this model of adaptability that i was looking for is staring at me in the mirror there is no better adaptable organization in the world organism in the world than the human okay to tell you an example so this realization begins here tell me an example here a story many of you have heard about you know many of you must have seen the movie ice age which has the saber tooth tigers and the you know woolly mammoths well the entry of Amer of indians of uh, humans into north america was about 10000 years ago so in uh, history that's a pretty recent history okay. so 10000 years ago when humans entered north america through europe they were more or less like you and me so there wasn't much change we haven't evolved that greatly since then but what their competition was was these kinds of animals saber tooth tigers which had nine inch stiletto like knife like you know teeth very powerful forearms that would grab you and just puncture you they wouldn't even bite you they would puncture your uh, your jugular and you'd be dead in a matter of seconds so this is a you know a fossil that we have from this is a fossil okay that we have from that time to just show you what kind of teeth this is this is a reconstruction of course but this is an actual fossil to see what kind of teeth they had so now if you flip forward 10000 11000 years there are no saber tooth tigers there are no woolly mammoths there are humans why because paleontologists now believe that what happened was that humans used their intelligence to adapt to this environment they didn't have the resources like the tigers or the uh, woolly mammoths they grouped together they made tools and it comes back to that name that we have for our species homo sapiens sapiens is the thinking animal which has wisdom which develops wisdom okay and the driver of this is of course intelligence so here i seem to have found something and in fact if you look at it the story of human resi uh, resilience is not is about okay it's all of course it's written in all the history books where you say oh there are the exploits of kings and victorious armies but it's also in the ordinary pages of our everyday lives when we start you know finding out how we can get around some problem how we can resolve something okay. so why is it that we call it intelligences and not intelligence so i'm talking about intelligences in the plural so because this was a big discovery a big step for me as i was starting to make the transition from being a microeconomist trained at the wharton school who models organizations like mathematics uh, using nonlinear equations and then make it move to something else now i'm finding a human connection here so just let's answer this very simple question and i've asked this of many friends how would you find out the distance from your home to your favorite movie theater several possible come up for us you could use a math formula to compute the distance or you could look up a map on the uh, you know internet you could drive there and look at your odometer now you could draw a picture or you could call and ask a friend hey what do you think the distance is from here to there now what is this telling us that the same problem can be solved in different ways which are all the intelligences so my framework that came up the vivekan framework is that if you want to be strategically agile which is that you want to be adaptable in the world you need to have these four intel four kinds of intelligences analytical which allows you to look up a map or look back into your database and reason from there or calculate operational which allows you to jump into action and do the stuff and actually solve the problem by doing or inventive Oh yeah, let's draw a picture. Let's draw a parallel. Let's take a solution from another domain and apply it here. That's inventive or communicative. You ask a friend. You rely on the community for an answer. Okay. So this was a framework that was going quite well. And if you notice, there's a discrepancy between the title on the slide and the number of intelligences I have here. Right. 
So this was going hunky dory. I was, you know, explaining all kinds of business successes. I was explaining why Enron, for instance, could be named number one company in innovation for five years in a row. And suddenly, what happened? Enron went kaput. And in India, another company that I had explained the success of on the basis of this model, Satyam, went kaput. So back to the drawing board for me to ask, you know, what happened here? What did I miss out? And then I realized that one of the critical things that I had missed out was this thing called visionary intelligence. And that's the difference that makes, that's what makes the difference between agility, the short term response and strategic agility, which is a long term forward thinking response. Okay. What visionary intelligence does, is takes, takes this action, anything that you do and makes you ask the question, what is it in the future? How many people will it impact? In what ways? So think long term, think wide. These are the kinds of questions that come out with the visionary intelligence. And once you engage in visionary intelligence, you start to realize that you're actually building a sustainable organization. You're actually building something that can be sustained within you. Now, some very, this is a framework that I won't go into these things, but this is a framework that we have, the five intelligences. And one of the key things that emerges, just to flip back there, is uh, that intelligences are very context sensitive. So let's take Winston Churchill, who was a leader, uh, you know, with the unparalleled, unparalleled um, approval ratings in 1945 when the World War II ended. He had 83% approval ratings. But what happened in the British elections that, that took place one month after the World War II in the European theater ended? Your Churchill lost big time. Why? Today, leadership experts believe that the British public knew that Churchill was a great wartime leader, but not a good peacetime leader. So what does this mean? That there is context-sensitive leadership. That means that you need to be able to adapt to different contexts. And what, what we've been finding is that whether it's a leader as a person or a leader as a company, you start to realize that these are the five different intelligences and different combinations apply in different perspectives, in different uh, situations. And not only that, we also find that all of us have these intelligences except that our combinations are different. So it is very wrong for us to say, oh, an artist or a painter is different from a photographer, photographer who's also an artist, right? So the kinds of intelligences that we have differ with each of us and that's a big thing because now what we can do is find these combinations of intelligences and match them to the environment we're working on. Okay. So here comes the last part of my thing which is the transformation. Okay. One of the big transformations that happened was suddenly I discovered that within organizations these used to be siloed. Innovation used to be part of R&D and operations. Leadership used to be part of human resource development and strategy used to be mostly in the corporate boardroom. And these were kind of siloed and not much communication was happening between these. But suddenly, intelligence comes in and is able to spin around and address each of these uh, issues uh, with the same kind of framework. Okay. One of the key things that happened, big, big that happened because of this framework for me was that suddenly a new way of looking at risk opened up. Okay. Typically, if I give you a set of balls, and say, you know, there are five colored, five red colored balls and five white colored balls. Bet, close your eyes, pick a ball and bet on getting a red ball. Well, you will make some estimation of five versus five, so maybe a 50% probability of me winning, you'll place a bet. Now, if I tell you that the combination is eight balls of red and two balls of white, then basically you'll say, oh, maybe I'll increase my bet. That's exactly what we did so far in strategic thinking. But now, suddenly, if I tell you, you know what, I'm going to give you a bowl, but I'm, and I'm going to tell you that there are balls inside here, but I won't tell you how many red balls and how many white balls. That's when we get into uncertainty. But not only that, when we're operating in a world that is very, very turbulent, we're engaging in something called deep uncertainty, where we start to say, well, we don't even know if there's a box with balls, right? So strategy, suddenly becomes not only we need strategy that will not only be deliberate, which means that we can foresee the future and plan for it, but also emergent just to address things that are emerging right at the beginning. 
uh, right as the moment. Okay. So, intelligence is, is a very good framework for us to use that. Okay. So, what happens with strategy is that strategy now no longer becomes a, a plan for actions to be performed in the futures, future, but it becomes about developing capabilities to handle uncertainty. One of the big things that I have been seeing in this conference and I, I think which is very, very heartening is that we are talking about humanizing various things. In fact, what the intelligence does is humanize the organization. So, so far we used to think of the organization as an economic entity sitting there making profit loss decisions, but now we start to actually humanize the entire endeavor of, uh, of, of the organization, of the corporate organization. Okay. So, what happens is that we bring in long term, we think wide impact and we also think beyond the bottom line. So, beyond me, what exactly is am I doing for the world? In this, we start to build dynamic cultures and so build strategic agility and as a result build resilience. To illustrate this, let me take you to the concept of leadership. Since I said leadership, innovation and strategy are all interlinked, let me give you a couple of examples from leadership. Okay. Our definition of leadership is this, leaders are ordinary people who use intelligences to transform ordinary acts to have extraordinary impact. Tell you a story from about a Brazilian farmer. Brazil denuded forests, lots of deforestation, so as a result the sea water starts to, salt water starts to flood her farm. These farms have never seen flooding, never been exposed to flooding, leave alone two times with salt water a day. right? So, what does this woman do, Rosaria Costa Cabra? She studies the flooding pattern for two years, sees what kinds of plants grow in those plants and populates that and in fact, not only does she grow in her own farm, she starts to spread it across the community and she becomes a leader in her community. So, simple everyday act becomes uh, you know, an act of leadership. And of course, every time I, I bring up Gandhi, Many of my friends said, oh, he's an ideal, we can never be like Gandhi. So, at least to humanize him, I gave you this nice smiling picture of Gandhi. Okay. But let me tell you a story about this with which I will end. This is immediately, this is from the Attenborough film and of course, it's not a clip, it's just a picture, but I want to tell you the story. The story is that in 1942 or 1947, immediately after the Calcutta riots, Gandhiji went on a fast and he said he will fast unto death if the violence does not stop. So, you have the Hindus coming in and laying down their swords and Muslims coming in and laying down their swords and suddenly one Hindu man breaks down. He says, I killed a boy, a Muslim boy, I smashed his head against the wall. And Gandhi's solution for him, adopt a Muslim boy this high and bring him up a Muslim. That is an everyday act that has extraordinary impact okay. and the key thing that Gandhi is relying on there is visionary intelligence. Okay. So, for me the message if I have to give you one is use intelligences to better the world, change the world, do not think of doing it in revolutionary ways, think of it in of doing it in small steps and you must lead because you have the intelligences and you can. Thank you.